Welcome to Brave Dynamics. This is your host, Jeremy Yao. Leadership is harder than it looks. As a proven founder and Harvard MBA, I interview courageous entrepreneurs, executives, and investors every week. I also share my frontline experiences, coaching insights, and own professional development journey. If you're stepping up as a new leader, founding a startup, or venturing into a great unknown, this is the podcast for you. Hey, good to see you again. Good to see you, Jeremy. I'm so excited to share your journey or the up, down, sideways part of life. Be fun chat. Yeah, 100%. The big question on everybody's mind is, who are you? I'm Brent, Brent Leung. I'm 23 year old. I'm a law school dropout. And I'm currently working as the co-founder and executive producer on The Quest, which is a podcast project with Justin Khan, the co-founder of Twitch. And before that, I founded three different companies and I'm also a recording artist and I try to paint pictures in my free time. So I guess that's a bit of a rundown about who I am. Let's walk through the beginning. What, 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 where does the beginning of your professional journey begin and kind of walk us through that chronologically to where you are today? Yeah, for sure. I think the start of my professional journey was probably after I finished high school and starting my first year of university. I chose to do law because I wanted to get better at English. I thought going through a six year of law school would help me be able to speak English and use the language in this like really great way. Because I, I lived in China for 18 years. So like Mandarin was what I've been speaking for 18 years pretty much. And so I wanted to be a lawyer. I think that's what I thought when I got into law school. But very quickly, I looked at some of the, the folks, law firm partners, and I had some internships. And I was like, oh, I don't know if I wanted to be a lawyer. And so that would be the start of my professional journey. But I think I took a really quick turn after a year in. I built my, my mini podcast project for my first year of law school. It was actually about torts, which is a subject that we learned on civil wrongs. So for example, if you go out, if your car got jacked by someone, or if your bicycle got stolen by someone, that's a, that's a torts offense, and you can take the person to court. So I thought that stuff was interesting. I don't know why I thought that was interesting, but I made a, I tried to make a podcast out of it. Got a couple of friends, got some lectures, our tutors to come on board, and I didn't know how to make anything. I didn't know how to do anything. So I just basically watched like a bunch of YouTube tutorials, learned how to use GarageBand, and I self-produced this like mini podcast series. It went really well. And I think starting from there, I was like, well, startup seems to be pretty interesting because you're also trying to like figure out stuff, like projects that you can build. And so, yeah, I think that's like the start aspiring, I guess, law student disillusion with the world. And so I put myself in a deep uh, building startups. Awesome. And what was it like building your first set of startups? That's a long story. I mean, second year after building my mini podcast project, I launched the project. I didn't know what to do with it. I think we got a couple K uh, listens slash views on SoundCloud, but just left it left there, you know? And I, I actually didn't know what a startup means at the time. So I enrolled in this competition called Law Without Walls, which was like this international conference program that brings together lawyers, law students, VCs to build what they call projects of worth. It's like a semi startup kind of idea. And our first startup was called Kite. It was in the legal tech industry. And the idea was we're able to build some kind of tech tools for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders when some of the juvenile offenders, when they're sitting in bail, we would be able to assist, connect them with like a community network and help them get better support system instead of you know, getting into for the trouble when they're sitting inside. So that was what we got assigned as a project of worth. And I mean, I saw it as a startup. It turned out that it was slightly different when you're going for a competition. So yeah, it was... I think it was like four to five months of just researching and talking to people. It was very difficult for us because it's a very different, I guess, segment of audience that we're interacting. To an extent, it's like we didn't know our customers that well. It's not like you're building a startup, let's say, delivering food or I don't even know, like e-commerce, where you can actually take an Uber and chat to your customers or pick up a phone and call them. For us, our end audience are very much like like a whole other segment of society that we have to consciously reach out and chat to. And it's very difficult. And so we did a lot, of, like we spent a lot of time trying to do all of that outreach interviews. And I think we did like 40, 60 interviews before we actually started building our thing. But like even with all of that, I mean, we had like, I had amazing mentors who were able to guide me for like every single step of the journey. 
you know, I was just like a terrible founder back then. I didn't know any better. I didn't know how to build a product. I didn't know what it really means to acquire customers. I thought, you know, you can get by without having a customer. I don't know how that thought like crossed my mind, but I think that was like, I was very stubborn in thinking that startups are pretty much just like about building things. And that's not it, right? Like you, you're solving problems, you're not building things. So towards the second half of the year, started seeing problems, you know, our, we had like a brief idea for an MVP, but we weren't able to really onboard any customers. And at the same time, you know, all of the problems that I mentioned about not being able to chat to our customers closely started to show up. And so we, we had some like miscommunication issues. I had a lot of workload on my plate and I was really stressed out by it. I like got a team of volunteers and it turned out to be not a very smart choice because the work that I was doing were just work for the sake of it, you know, and you actually spent more time managing people instead of just getting those work done. So I was like not a very effective leader back then. And yeah, towards the end of the year, something, you know, we had this miscommunication with a really big stakeholder, which was a court and the whole thing just like boiled over, you know, it got really ugly where like lots of emails that were threatening were sent. And it got me to a place where I was really conflicted about whether I should pursue the startup or not, because I felt like pursuing it would mean to tackle a lot of the things head on and actually like we're sort of resulting, it's, it would result in like harm to the community that we're trying to serve because we weren't able to navigate those landscapes as skillfully. And if we shut it down, obviously it's like something I've worked on for almost a year, I feel terrible and the team feels terrible as well. So like, sort of like you're stuck between a rock and a hard place, you know? And so eventually we did shut it down after a year. There were those days, I think we, well, you know, we talked about this like earlier before coming onto the show, but there, there were days where I felt really bad that I would wake up not having like the strength physically, mentally to even check the email inbox. So I would go out, take a walk, take a run, come back, do my push-ups, go for a shower, and then like click open the email inbox. And even then, like you still get like those mini, mini spikes of anxiety. That's something that's, that tends to be typical for lawyers. But I think for me, you know, it happened at a much younger age. And so I kind of felt what, what it was like to be controlled or like to have your startup turn into something that could be like, that feels like a monster. Like it feels like a really, really bad day job. I was only aware that later on that that wasn't supposed to be <laughs> how it feels. But I thought at the time that when we talk about startup hustle, like that's how it feels. I'm glad that we closed it on after a year though. I think that was a smart choice to make. And yeah, I think we made, like I made a lot of really good personal human connections throughout that whole experience. I think it, it really grounded me at such a young age thinking I could do anything in the world. Whereas, you know, building startup is actually quite tough. You have to solve a real problem. It doesn't matter what you profess to be good at. Wow. I mean, that's one heck of a journey. And I think you said a couple of really interesting things, right? Which is like, being a first time founder is hard, you know, that's one. And then two, it almost sounds like you've gotten the self-awareness of how, what was normal and what was abnormal or difficult only after the, <laughs> the first time as well, which is, I think, a very common journey for so many first time founders, right? It's like, they know they're struggling. Well, they are struggling. They don't know they're struggling. They think struggling is normal. And then when they're out of it, they're like, wait a moment, it's different, right? The, the approach I could have taken could have been different. And, I personally share that thing. I mean, there were so many times in my past two companies where I literally couldn't do the email either. And I would, I would just give my phone to my wife or my sister. And I'd just be like, can you just read the email to me? <laughs> and this, you know, it's like, because I'm like, okay. I, Yo, I, wish, I wish I could do that. I don't think my parents are uh, trying yeah. to read my emails, but I, yeah. maybe I should have tried my brother. Maybe you should have tried that. There's a handy trick. It's like, because you don't want to read it, but you're like, is just give it to my wife. And it's like, okay, I haven't, I'm supposed to read this an hour ago. So it's not too bad, but I know I'm procrastinating. So if you can read it to me and just give me the gist of it. And then I'll just tell you what I'm going to reply. And that's good enough, right? Because I'm worried about the tone. I'm worried about all the stuff. And when someone else is summarizing it for me, you know, I'm like, okay, I know what I need to say, right? But I can, and I think one of my realizations only after my first company was like, oh, I really need to move a lot of tough decisions into a verbal meeting, right? I mean, it was just like, there's just way too many tough emails that was just, I felt it was impossible to solve over email. And actually it was pretty much impossible to solve over email because personal issue, right? It's not a logic or a text issue. And so I was like procrastinating and I was making things worse. Whereas, you know, I need to move that into personal domain, right? You know, it's a personal decision. You got to make it into a personal domain. So, and all that stuff I only realized 
after the, my first company, right? It would just, it would just I'd be like, oh man, I wish I knew that earlier. Your first company always teaches you so much. And in a way, it's almost like it's great if it's a failure because you learn a lot more. I think that sort of steepness of the learning curve is hard to be replicated if you do it for your third, second or third because you have, you have, like, you've got a lot to lose. And so you wouldn't be able to like, take on those learnings as quickly. Yeah, I totally agree. I mean, I think this classic thing where like a startup is supposed to be hockey shape, you know, in terms of growth. And then humans don't have hockey shape in terms of learning curve. Like they're mostly like linear or flat even, you know. I mean, I always tell people it's like when I was in the middle school, it's like every year I did one year of math, right? So year one, you got one year of math. Year two, you did your second year of math. Year three, you did another one year of math, right? Year four, you do another one year of math. But if you're supposed to be succeeding as a startup, is year one, you do one year of math. Year two, you do two years of math, right? Year three, you do four years of math. And then year four, you do eight years of math, right? You know? And nobody does that. No, we would be like, if we were teachers and trying to teach the kids, we'd be like, as principals or teachers, we'd be like, this is a fucked up way <laughs> to teach kids because all of them are going to break by year two, year three, right? I think what I think you said was very true, right? Which was that if you fail, at least you... I mean, I've learned about the business itself, but at least you learn about your own rate of learning, which is actually much more important because when you, whatever you do your next startup, you, you know, the only thing you carry over is yourself, right? Exactly. Now that's a good quote. <laughs> so what did you carry over to, the, to your second venture? What I made sure to do in my second venture was we wanted to start thinking about customers from day one. We wanted to have this really clear vision about who's going to be paying like from day one. And I tried to make sure that we get to our product piece a lot sooner than what I would otherwise typically do. So a bit of backstory about the second startup. I, I was able to meet someone really fortunate when I was in Sydney. And this person came from Myanmar and she was about to embark on some like social influencer work. Like she was wanted to make content. She wanted to be a content creator. And so I had the opportunity to, tra to travel to Myanmar where I was able to understand the market conditions a lot more talk to people, get to know people. And so we built this like business that's off her personal brand, which actually went, went, went really well. And she was able to get to like 1 million followers on Facebook relatively quickly. And so we built this business that's basically like a, the, the vision for it was like, we wanted to be the biggest MOOC for Myanmar. And I think one thing that we nailed down really well, which helped us get to product market fit, was that we had this format of influencer-led soft skill training. So like the classes aren't just taught by instructors, they're taught of like people who have brand in, in the country. And one thing about Myanmar is, you know, whenever you want to sell something like goods or services, it's much better if you're able to tie it with someone that people actually trust. That worked very well in Myanmar. I don't know if you can replicate that to like other countries in the region, but at, at the very least, like what we know is it was really well in Myanmar. And so we, we were selling courses on soft skills, on basically things that you wouldn't be able to learn that much in the university. Like we weren't teaching any physics courses or or anything that's like hard science. It was more like language, business skills, like stuff that's like actually practical and useful for folks. Because a lot of them actually haven't gone to university and we don't want to take that. Like we don't want to be sort of this like alternative education program for them. It's, it's too much risk for us. But yeah, we did all those courses and went really well. And I think one of the reasons why we got there quickly, it was like I said, when you have an influencer, in a way, you like your customer acquisition channel is a lot more smooth. And so yeah, a lot of people who came through or like converted by my co-founder's brand, we, we were able to charge for the classes relatively quickly. And I think one of the, one of the important moments for me was I was always thinking, you know, this has to be like a MOOC website. So we got to build something. So we got to, I got to learn how to code. You know, I was learning Python for like a month. I, was, I didn't even know I was learning Python for building a website. But anyways, <laughs> at one point I was like, yo, like, you don't have to do all of that. Maybe everyone was on Facebook in Myanmar. So why can't we build something leveraging the tool, the tool set that we've got from Facebook. And, and so we, we took a few days and we launched something. It's like super simple. When someone wanted to pay for a course, they would just transfer the money into our bank account and then they would do a screenshot. And then they would send that screenshot to us. And then once we check that, we'll just add them into like a little secret Facebook group. And then we push all of the videos from there. Like it makes so much sense if you think about it, but it's like, we can do that in like a week. And get the whole business up and running. It's probably not going to be able to scale very well if once we hit like you know 4,500k or something. That's actually proven to be a wrong assumption. It, it worked well once we hit that volume as well. But yeah, like we, we we launched it and we just basically you know that was our MVP and we never really upgraded our MVP. We just kept it running for like 
almost like two years straight. And we got to 40K MRR in like a year and then like one mil ARR by, the, uh, by a year and a half. We scaled our team to 15, 20 people. I got to give credit to my co-founder here because I was actually, I, I came back to Sydney. Uh, like I, I was in Myanmar during my university breaks. And so I came back to Sydney for like most of the time during my studies. Yeah, like she made everything happen on the ground, you know, and she's amazing. Yeah, I'm really glad of, of how, how much progress we're able to make in such a short period of time. And what that meant for me, I think, just to answer your question in terms of like new learnings and, and stuff, is first of all, like the set of problems that you deal with as a founder starting out to find product market fit is very different from the problems that you face after you found product market fit. I think one of the things that I struggled with earlier on was building right? Talking to customers and building the thing that they actually want. It's like an art. You have to really remove your ego from the equation and literally just take on this role of like a designer. You got to design whatever makes sense for them, even if it's not something that really, that's really, that sounds really sexy for you, for yourself. And so that was like the challenge that I had to go, get over myself before PMF. But after that, like after we started to get revenue and you started to have team members come on and stuff. For me, one of the bigger challenges was like hiring. Like I had no idea what it looks like for people that would bring to the team, designers, no idea how to hire them, coders, develop, the developers, no idea. I would, I would read a lot of articles and think, culture fit, what does that mean? Zoom calls. Like if I chat to them, I like them, great, they're in. Like sometimes they, they, you know, they fail miserably. They don't know how to, how to even put up like a simple like design work or they don't know how to do things at the spec that I want which I didn't really communicate very well to them before. So like a lot of those problems started to surface up. And then like when it comes to team, I think at 80%, 90% of the time came from communication. We weren't able to do our communication well. So like lots of inefficient meetings, lots of folks getting into like, like almost like mini arguments with stuff that wasn't transparent and just like emotions and like resentment that, that came from not being able to express things very well. And I think, one of the things that I realized was when you, when you have those problems in your startup, it doesn't make any sense to blame anyone because all of that just manifests from the founder. Like it's almost like the startup is like a reflection of yourself, right? Like if you're able to build, like if you're not comfortable with like all hands meetings, then you will tend to like run less of those. And then when you run less of those, people will feel like there's not as much of a need to communicate or like if they work on a project, it's not as not really worth it to like make sure everyone else understands. So like in a way you're like setting that culture and that manifests from your preference to not do those meetings too often, which could result, like it could be a root, like the root cause for that could be that you just need to train up yourself, like to have more confidence. So like little things like that, always coming back to thinking, oh, like what did I do to make it happen? And oh, like, okay, here's my character flaw. Like it's like a mirror, you're holding on to your mirror and it shows all of the character flaws in you. And so I learned a lot from that. And I think it really takes almost like your co-founder or other people, mentors to make you aware of those things and to give you actionable steps about what you can do to improve. And so that was one of my biggest learnings for my second startup, managing a team and making sure that the team has like crystal clear communication. I don't think I did a really good job at that at the point where I left, but I feel like that was the the growth that I experienced the most, I mean, in terms of just how I see myself grow as a founder. You know, I just want to underscore to the audience how important what you just said was about the company and the startup is a reflection of the founder. And when there are problems with the startup is often a manifestation of not necessarily problems with you, but who you are and how you've chosen to conduct your actions, right? And I think that's super underrated comment because it's a very tough thing to say, right? I mean, we always hang out with other founders and then founders are like, I remember I was this friend and this guy was like, I don't understand why everyone's selling so hard. We need to have better marketing. We need, you know, everyone's too salesy internally. And then I looked at him and he's like the most salesy guy that I know. <laughs> and, I'm like, and I'm just like, well, like as a friend, you're like, this is an awkward thing to say, right? And then you're like, this is, you know, you just trust your, your friendship and relationship and just say, Look, you came from a sales background. You're building a company in sales. You're hiring lots of sales reps. <laughs> yeah, everyone's going to be more salesy, right? You know? And now what you're saying is you want to round out the team. With, it's a valid acknowledgement, right? Which is you can't build a sales company with just sales. You have to do other stuff like thought leadership, marketing, people leadership, you know, all kinds of different things, right? 
And then you're part of it. You know, it's, it's not a bad thing, but, you know, we have just to be intentional about it. Right? It's not a bad thing. You know, is this, is this, we built the things we're most comfortable with, right? Yeah. So you just, I just want to say like how underrated a comment what you just said was. And I think so many founders have that struggle because they're like, they build something and they're like getting a product market fit and then suddenly it works, right? You know, suddenly an investor comes in and then they're growing or whatever it is. And then they're like, these are all these terrible things happening. It's, it's tough. It's, 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 it's a tough conversation. There's like stuff is just like breaking every day and, and there's always a problem that's, that's going on. I think it's really funny because for us, we never really raced around, if that makes sense. And I think it's really fortunate that we didn't have to do any of that because I think a lot of times people are more concerned about raising money than getting their product to be working, which is a very big myth in this whole industry. And so, yeah, like I think for us to bootstrap and go all the way to like 1 million ARR, that's, that's something that I'm really proud of. But at the same time, like, it does feel like there's no, not much of a support network. I'm pretty sure if we've got more angels, you know, let's say sitting on our board, you can basically call out for support. We didn't really have any avenue for, for that to happen. So like for us, it was just like tackle it head on and be okay with things breaking every day. I think a lot of founders will, will say that even when you start getting revenue, like that's just like the start of a new journey and things will still feel shitty. I actually tend to disagree. I think things feel shitty, but like, you know, you're safe. And that's a really good feeling. Like when you get money coming in every single week, when you get customers paying and they're like happy in some way, you're dealing with problems, but then it doesn't really, like it's not existential. Like I think pre-launch, before you get to PMF, things are pretty serious. Like if something is not working, if you launch an experiment and it doesn't seem to work, that would get to me and I'll be like, okay, I need to work 10 times harder. I don't know when this is going to work. You know, I don't know when this is going to you know, hit, hit that mark. But once you hit there, like once you get to PMF, it's about how fast you can go to like grow. And that challenge feels a lot more, I think, urgent, but less intense, if that makes sense. Yeah, that makes total sense. I think founders say it's more difficult because they don't really have a language to say this is new, <laughs> you know, because you know what I'm saying? Like, so it's not more difficult because you and I both know it's way more difficult to like have no money and just be <laughs> burning all your savings while trying to cut your expenses to zero. So that's very hard, right? And I think so many founders sometimes use the wrong language to say like raising a seed round or raising a series A, it's hard, right? And don't get me wrong, it's, it's hard, but it's not hard because it's hard. It's hard because it's new, right? And, and sometimes the language matters so much, right? It's like the first dollar in, the first customers are, they're not hard, they're happy, you know, they give you money, right? You're like, oh, like you're giving me way more value than I thought I would because your founder, you know, customer support. I remember I was, I was buying some service and I managed to break their, break their service. I knew him from a while ago as a friend. And so I messaged him and I said, hey, I signed on too many users for this case and I think I broke your product. And then he's like, he, he personally, the founder, personally responded to me and said, okay, let me fix it, right? And I'm thinking to myself, you know what? I'm paying like what? Five, 10 bucks a month. Like I'm totally getting my bang for the buck, right? I'm getting the founder, you know, a former YC guy to fix my customer support for me, you know, my problem for me. This is great, right? And so I think it's, some, it's so much of a framing thing, right? It's like customers are happy to throw money at you. And then founders are like, this is hard. When is this be like, oh, this is new, right? You know, and it's uncomfortable. I like that reframing. I think that's very helpful. What was new for you? I mean, you know, obviously, what I think was also not new, not only was the industry, but also the geographies as well, which is something I've noticed. It's very special about you so far. It's like, it feels like, You've been quite ambidextrous in history, and you've also been very ambidextrous in terms of geography. So I'm just kind of curious about how you think about that. Yeah, for sure. So I don't know if I qualify as a Gen Z, probably not. <laughs> a tiny bit. I'm like, I missed that train. But I think I'm lucky to be born in an age where I actually think geography doesn't matter as much. You know, like I was born in New Zealand. I moved to China when I was six months old. So like technically I'm a Kiwi, but I'm actually not. And then technically I'm Chinese. I don't, I don't have like a passport or an ID. And then when we built our business in Australia, like everyone will look at me as an Australian and that's not technically true as well. So like in a way, it's almost like I, need, I, was, I was brought up in a, in a world where those labels just don't tend to apply as much to me. I mean, it obviously resulted in like its own problems where I think I moved to like five, six different high schools growing up. Being able to form friendships or build relationships quickly with people was like a life skill that I had to learn. Otherwise, I just don't have any, any long-term sort of friend attachments because I, I just move around too much. But when you're able to realize all of that, like it makes you feel that 
it doesn't really matter like where you've been brought up and, and stuff. Like the two co-founders for my first uh, startup was, they were from uh, the US and South Africa and like remote work was something that the Low Without Walls program has been pushing for uh, since its beginning. And it's like so innovative, but like we got used to basically that whole work style before all of the stuff but with COVID happened. And so that like the whole year we were working just purely via like Google Hangout calls. And I just felt like I thought, I thought that was a natural way of working because I got into it obviously in my first, second year of university. Like I thought that was like the norm. And so when I got used to it, like it doesn't really matter if my first, my second co-founder left in Myanmar and we chatted over like FaceTime. It didn't really matter that for my start startup, you know, we actually traveled to UK and we came to the US, met with Bill Clinton. You know, all of that stuff was like, whatever opportunities are, like, you know, if we can get like a ticket, let's say, like to go there, to talk to people who might be useful for our company, like, let's do that. And like, I think with COVID, everyone is like seeing that happening in live action. I got onto this current project with Justin Khan when we have like no connection with each other whatsoever, right? I, I'm just like random kid in Australia. He's living in uh, somewhere in the, in the States and like, we wouldn't be able to even know each other for like our entire lives. But once you have the right channel on the internet and you're able to trust someone else and you're able to build something with them and communicate frequently, anything could happen. I think you can build a startup, you can build whatever you can, you can, I don't even know, like you can probably build a lot of other stuff as well. You can probably start like a TV show or, or something, you know, like you are doing this podcast. I, I don't, I don't, you know, it is crazy. Like, this is a really good example. I don't, I don't know you, but like, you know, we met through on deck and now we're doing a podcast together. And, and I feel like I'm having a conversation that's like so authentic and deep. It's almost like I'm talking to someone that I've known for, you know, a couple of years. And so I think that's something that we're seeing a lot more in this new age. Just got to get used to it. So like, I don't even think about geographies. Maybe some of the investors will be concerned possibly with some of that stuff. But like for me, it's about the person. It's about where we can make the product work. And it's about whether the market is good or not. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And I'm sure the question that everybody's thinking to themselves, like, how did you start one, start up two, start up three, and now you're with Justin Ken, right? I mean, this guy's like got founders talk, talking to him or trying to email him up the wazoo, right? This YC, you know, my last co-founder, Tatiana and I, we would follow him on Snapchat and we would like laugh at him driving his ATV up to his wedding in California. I've also personally met him a few times actually at his last company, Atrium services and i've worked with other executives that have reported to him but i was just kind of curious like you know that's very different from me being a client to or pitching or consuming to you working with him so how did you do that from the middle of nowhere i guess versus the center of the universe being america let me just quickly rush through how i got there i think i want to talk a bit about my third startup because that's what led me to this path and more of a connection with the us as well yeah, but like basically when I came like a year or two after we set up Chance Memoir, a Memoir business, and we're making a liquid revenue, I, I thought I couldn't really do this. From, I, could, I couldn't see myself doing this for my life, like for, for the rest of my life. And so you know, took a step back, became more of an advisor in the company, and I wanted to build something that's a lot more scalable, like something that's like on a global level, like YC ready start that's going to change the world. It's like, I think that's what young kids typically think about when they want to try to you know, go big. And so... I wanted to solve the problem, like I said earlier, with me hiring. Like I saw a lot of my founder friends who were quite young, who were able to raise lots of money, who had trouble with hiring. And so we were building, we wanted to build this platform that, that's able to distribute those hiring challenges for them. Like if you wanted to bring on a designer, we would co-create some kind of design challenges that would basically let you test for like what good looks like. And so you would send that challenge to a designer before you wanted to bring, uh, bring them into the team. They would finish the challenge. And then you, you know, we, like us as a platform, we would like rate the challenge in some way by our algorithm. And so that gives you like a pointer or an indicator about how good the person is before you, you have them come in. So we, you know, we, we built that, went for this competition called the whole price, which was like a pitching competition. We were invited to go to pitch in Dubai. Uh, we won that round, got to the UK, stayed for two months in a castle to build the business. And then we went to the US, met with Bill Clinton, pitched, but didn't really get the $1 million coming through. And then I, I lived in Silicon Valley for two months. And I think. When I was couch surfing through the US, I had like no money on me at the time. And I stayed on some uh, really good friends in a, in a house uh, for two months. And that whole period just like changed my perspective. It changed my perspective about what's possible. 
So when I was in the US, in Silicon Valley, like I thought I was going to leave after a couple of weeks. So I, I was like, this place has some of the best, most brilliant people in venture, in, in startups around the world, right? And so I, wanted, I need to meet them. I don't know how I'm going to get to them, but I need to meet them. Otherwise, like, I'm just going to take a flight all the way back to Australia, like 20, 20 plus hours. That sounds pretty bad. And so I was like, what can I do to meet them? I was stuck. I was trying to find out emails and I sent a bunch of them. Heard, heard from some, didn't really hear from others. And I was like, oh, you know, I don't know how to do it. But then one day I talked to one of my friends and, you know, they were just like, just like, take an Uber, show up at their house and talk to them. I was like, what? Like, I cannot imagine how you would even say that. But then I thought about it. I was like, if I can somehow manufacture this opportunity to like meet them or to make, a, make an impression, there's nothing wrong with that, right? So I actually did that. So like I, I, would, I would draft like handwritten notes about what I wanted to get from each conversation. And I would put that note in like an envelope and I would go to some of those VCs, VCs residences, which I was able to find out by actually using one of my old law firm's credentials and check their SEC filings, whatever. And then I'll go, go there, try to see if there's like any signs outside that says like no trespasses, whatever. And I would like pass the note like underneath the door. Every, every time I did that, I would get the conversation coming through. It's so funny, but like when I meet them in person, they'll be like, like I'm framing that note in my house. Like, I'm so glad that you did that. And let's, let's chat. You know, it's funny because we weren't at a level we were able to raise. A lot of those conversations didn't really materialize into, let's say like a series A investor or something. But just being able to do that makes me understand that there's no need to like glorify someone and say, you're not going to be able to, to meet them up until you, you get an intro. Like you don't have to wait for the intro to happen. If you just go meet them, right? If you take an initiative and just do a bunch of those things, things will come your way. And so when I came back to Australia, I was working on that, on our startup for almost a whole year, got my personal burning rate to like zero. I was having ramen noodles every day. And then towards the end of the year, we had our first cu customer come on board. And just like in that one week, I was on the server called, G shout out to Gen Z Mafia. Like it's one of the best servers in the world out there. And Justin, you know, obviously he, he sent a message saying that he needs help with his podcast and this upcoming book. And he, would, he wants someone to basically help out with like things. And I thought that's like a really good part-time job opportunity. I was like, I can probably keep things going with like a bit of money from here. I can fund, it, fund my startup and whatever. And so I DM him, sent him all of my design samples. It was like 30 plus files. And every single message got sent as an individual message, which was crazy. Because I was just like spamming him out of nowhere. This like random kid from Australia spamming him with all of those graphics. Later, I knew I, that that's actually what he like. That he wasn't looking for any of that. He was looking for people who were like, was much better at like producing things. And so I was sending like graphic design and whatever. And but you know, halfway through, like fifty messages in, he was like, "Love it," and I was like, "Oh shit, <laughs> let me keep sending." So I sent like another fifteen or something. And then he was like, "Let's chat in, in two hours." And so I was so nervous. I called everyone that I knew. I called my co-founder. I talked to my parents. I. Uh, like I try to raft, you know, to, to like get my, myself ready and all that. And got onto a call. He was like sitting across the screen. It was like this Asian Jesus guy. You know, I, I was a big follower of Justin for a long time as well. So like seeing him in all of that majestic hair flowing down, like that was surreal. And I talked to him. And the one thing that I realized, like first couple of moments into the conversation, which is how vulnerable he was with me, like he, he basically talked he talked to me about all of the things that he's been thinking to do. And he talked to me about all the things that he's not sure about. So like, you know, he wasn't sure about, let's say, if we can make this podcast go big. He wasn't sure about what kind of help he actually needs. He wasn't sure about what kind of strategy in terms of promotion he we would need. And so he was asking me for help. And I think when you come to someone for help, it's a lot easier for the other person to pitch in. And like, it, it kind of de-stressed me. And it made me a lot easier to, to engage with him as a person. And so I think that first chat went, went quite well. I drafted a plan or something, sent it to him. And like a week later, we, I came in as a co-founder and executive producer for the podcast. One of the visions that I pitched him was like, I see a lot of things that are special with Justin and with his podcast. And I think it's just a matter of time that we get to be bigger than Joe Rogan. And moreover, like it, that's, not, that's not it. Like we're not even competing on the same, in the same arena. Like we are building like a cultural product, like a media company that's going to go beyond just an audio service. And it's something that it could be like one of the most exciting things, like cultural product, like ADA Rising, that's going to be able to be seen as like the most exciting projects for founders and creators worldwide. 
And Justin is one of those only people in the world where he can bring people like Michael Seibel and then have a chat with chain smokers the next day. You know, like he, he has the ability to bridge industries like that. And I think that's super special. So pitch him all of those visions and he was on board from like day one. We also wanted to try something different or we're, you know, we're building this, like we're trying this whole concept of like building a community around the podcast, which since has worked out very, very well. And so, yeah, that's how it went. And like a week after I came in, I had to chat with my co-founder again and we we're like, okay, well, it doesn't really make much sense if we wanted to keep both things going because I don't want to fail at either of them. And so we actually shut the startup down. We're transitioning to a, which we actually gave our product piece to a, another startup who are two of my friends, really, really good founders. Yeah. So like nothing that we've built was, has been wasted and it felt kind of great to say that. I mean, just basically since then, I've been dedicating full, full time to like growing the podcast and all of the other personal brand initiatives for Justin. Oh, wow. What a amazing i don't know what's what adventure and so brave right i mean a lot of bravery there at each stage and each day to do what you just had to do and i think the thing that jumped out to me was the part where you always push yourself to do something crazy <laughs> and you know <laughs> i'm just saying right and that's like i think everybody knows they gotta work hard right and people will do work hard and that's going to give you good results but sometimes you have to do some crazy shit and either you get zero from the market, you have, sometimes you get negative repercussions, but most of the time you get zero, right? You know, but sometimes when it does work, it works, right? And it's interesting where I love the part where you're like, yeah, you know, worst case scenario, like they would just ignore your, the, the letter under the door and then the best case scenario is they actually pick it up, right? And the worst case scenario of, you know, direct messaging Justin was, he would just ignore you. <laughs> I'll tell you it's bad. I wasn't losing anything. Like I'm, I'm not... He wasn't on my board. He, he wasn't someone that we wanted to bring into our company or anything. So like, even if I don't get a reply, it's like, okay, well, that's not going to, like, I can, I can still go about my day and do, a, do whatever I, you know, I, 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 I do every day. If, if anything came through, it would just like sort of change my life in a way and it happened. And so I think that's super important. Like actually, one of the things that we used to do at our third startup was we would set aside this time called moon shots. And every day we'd try to spend like 20% of the time, which typically rounds up to like an hour just doing completely like impossible things. Like we would email like Elon Musk. We would email like, let's say uh, Sam Altman saying, uh, can we like put in a Zoom call, email the founders of Canva, who's, who's an Australian, uh, like she's killing it, uh, Mileni, and saying, can we kind of grab coffee? Like things like that. We never really got any like proper response. I mean, there's a lot of interesting people that came through, but we just kept doing it. And I think it cultivated this habit where when we saw something like, you know, it got me to like Teal Fellowship interviews that kind of level. And, and I think that was really great because if we didn't have that habit, that kind, of, that kind of mindset, none of this stuff would actually happen. Like we probably wouldn't even get to our first customer. The thing about moonshots is like, whatever you do, like if you do it long enough, you're always going to land at a spot that's higher than what you would originally be. Like it just basically heightens up your trajectory. And I think it's super important. Like I, I, I kind of hope that it's, that's like a personal development goal for people as well. Like just every day, try to do something that's outside of your comfort zone. And that's a very, 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 like there's like a small percentage of it succeeding, but it, if it does, like it's going to just flip your life over. I think that's a very healthy way of, of just trying to make sure that you're going somewhere every day, you know? Yeah. I love the framing that you use the word moonshots. I never thought of it that way. It's such a good way to frame the negative way of saying it, which is doing something crazy. <laughs> well, the way your friends are saying I think crazy is still neutral in startup world, right? I think Doing something, I think negative would be like, oh, people say that you're doing something dumb or it's not worth your time. I think that's a negative frame. But I think Moon just makes it have a positive frame to be like, I, I like it actually. I think it's a good way. And I'm going to have to write it down my vo own vocab, which is, you know, about every day, but I think every week I could do maybe a moonshot. I'd be like, mm -hmm. today I'll have the uh, raspberry with Nutella ice cream. Maybe that's, that'll be my moonshot. <laughs> <laughs> that's not what I meant, but um, I'll, I'll take that. I'll take that. I want to go double click on, you know, something that you said was interesting, right? Which was the realization that this demigod, this Asian Jesus was also human, right? <laughs> and asking you for help and being open and vulnerable of you. How do you feel going through the, were you like surprised? Were you disappointed? More accepting? Like, oh, did you feel all those things? You know, what was it like to feel like the crash of the, the illusion, you know, the stage and the reality of a person on, on a video call with you? I think that's a really great question. That's something I kept asking myself as well, because I try to observe how things have changed and how I felt. 
the dynamic between me and Justin to, to be like. And I think one of the things that I can definitely say, and you can see this a lot in the quest, like it's one of the central messages I wanted to drive forward in the quest, you know, people are people. And eventually, like when you talk about some of those fundamental issues that we all go through, getting our personal wellness done right, or trying to go after one of our goals, or trying to go after something that you really want to do. And, and for that, you have to crawl through like miles of, of shit. Like everyone is connected on some level, right? Like all of the trouble that results from people not being able to connect is due to miscommunication and people not willing to share that because of a perceived threat that they would lose some kind of personal image in someone else's eye. So I think what Justin does really well is, I mean, there's like a side of him that I think is a really forceful executive. And that's something that he was very open about as well. There are aspects of that that made, I think, all of his companies successful, that pushed me to be the best version that I am. And that pushed the project and all of the stuff that I was working on to like, like we were hitting those targets and numbers like left and right. But there's also a very human side of him, right? And I think that's something that, that I, I was really lucky to get to see. And he made it come across super clearly from our first meeting. It was literally from like the first thing that he said, like I felt he was just very vulnerable and that he needs help with some of this stuff. And he actually, like he actually doesn't need that much help, but he made me feel that he, he's like super welcoming. And so like, it's so funny, like ever since I came into the podcast, you know, we were like in, we were in ground zero. And so we had to set up a lot of things up. And so like, I was texting Justin almost like every single day, like every single day, like 50 plus text messages. And so I was like, I, I wasn't even thinking about it, but like a week later, I was like, yo, am I texting the co-founder of Twitch? Like 50 plus messages every single day? Like who else in the world does that, right? Like, should I be paying money for this? Like, it's, this is crazy. And sometimes like he would just call me, like FaceTime me like out of nowhere. And I was like super stoked whenever that happened. But then it got to a point where I was like, yeah, he wasn't faking in any of this stuff. And he wasn't trying to do me a favor or anything as well. Like we were just two people who were trying to build something great and trying to make something happen. In that process, get to know each other better, get to know each other's goals better. Like all of our problems in a way as well. Like it's literally like a, like a co-founder relationship and it's one of the best I've ever had. And so I think when we built up that trust, we would set up like weekly sync calls but then when he would get busy and we, were, we wouldn't talk for a while and like, I wouldn't feel anything. I wouldn't, I wouldn't be like, okay, I don't know. Like we haven't got a contract done or something. Like, should we, should I be worried about being dropped from all of this? Should I find like another job as a backup? Like I never worried about any of that because the trust was so strong. And I knew that like fundamentally we care about each other as a person. And I just, I cannot stress about how important it is or, or, or you know, what kind of skills you have to get to build that kind of bond with someone who's like 10, 20 years younger than you. And Justin is at an age where he could probably be my dad, right? And like, I think just being able to forge that kind of connection with someone who's like Gen Z, like a lot of times, like we argue a lot, like there are things that I wanted to do that he doesn't agree with. There are things that like he, when I pr propose something, he would like poke holes in my ideas. If I was like the me two, three years ago, I would get very offended or I might suffer. I might think I might be defensive, but like with all of this, like with that fundamental piece of trust that's in place, a lot of this stuff becomes productive. And when it's productive, it feels good. Even if our ideas sort of conflict, and even, even if we argue, even if we do all of that, like it's, it's really, like I said, it's just really healthy. And I can see that his ability to do that obviously came through lots of trial and error, and he's had his fair share of success and let's say failures in his professional career. But I think that ability to like connect with people is what made Justin Khan very special. And one of the best mentors slash co-founders slash celebrities I've got to know. That's amazing. It's interesting because you really see the evolution of the relationship, right? From, you know, stranger to spamming <laughs> to, you know, kind of like building out together to, you know, storming the norms and where you are today. And obviously the journey is only just getting started, right? And I think you said something really special, which was like, you're kind of implying it, you know, it's like you're young, but you're not inexperienced. You know, you just experience in a different way, right? Does it make sense? Like you're younger, but you're not young. I mean, you're not like in diapers or anything. You're younger, but, you know, but that's a strength of its own, right? Because there's energy to get stuff done. Openness, you know, media is getting consumed by Gen Z, even though we're not Gen Z. <laughs> but things are moving fast, right? We've got to be aware of the mediums and moving fast. And so I think 
I think a lot of people self disqualify themselves as founders or co-founders, and they're like, "Oh, I can't do this or that," or because I'm too young. And I'm like, "Well, it's less about whether you're too young. It's really about how your experience has brought you to it, right? And if you're young and you're ex experienced enough to tackle the problem, maybe because some people are like, "Yeah, my family used to do." business in agriculture and so i know all about agriculture and i'm like yeah you know more about agriculture than someone 10 years your senior heck i could be 20 years your senior and i you probably know more about agriculture than i do right <laughs> because i've done zero work you know <laughs> and i just consume vegetables doesn't mean i know anything about vegetables right but you grew up living breathing on a farm right on a plantation right so and i like what you said you know i think you kind of like started sharing a little bit about you know, the strengths you bring to the table and the conversations you have. I guess for me, I guess the question I have is just like, how do you stay on top of all this stuff? Like, how do you learn, <laughs> you know? Because, you know, it's like you're not, even though this is not necessarily a startup startup, it's still, you know, I think I definitely can feel like each company you're doing is, again, slightly related to each other in terms of the individual skills, but totally different in terms of industry. <laughs> I think legal, book, hiring, and now podcast. So that's really four different industries from a you know, pen and paper approach. So the only thing constant is yourself, right? And so you're learning fast and everything. So in what ways are you learning fast? And in what ways are you, do you feel like you're learning slow or need to improve? I think I tend to learn very fast when I feel like I'm out of my depth, which is scary. That's something I'm actually trying to optimize and improve on. Because I think when, when you do something out, like driven by fear, it might work very well, but it's not very sustainable. But like if I look at all of the stuff that has, has happened in the past, when I felt like I was out of my depth and something needs to get done and there's no one else that I can put onto that task where I need to own it, then I would like learn like crazily fast. Like for example, when I got put onto Justin's project, one of the first things that I had to do was like, how do we like 10 time our listens like in, in a month? I wanted to prove myself to him like that we can, that we can do it in a, in a month or two. But like the only experience that I've ever had my experience is primarily with like building companies. I think I know a tiny bit about what, like what that would involve. But when it comes to like building podcasts or following through any sort of media projects, like I said, the only thing that I've done was like back in first year of law school when I made that mini podcast and that wasn't very impressive. I didn't really follow through. But like, I felt like I was out of my depth and I was like, I signed up for a job as a producer, but I don't know what the hell this job actually even requires. And I don't know if I'm qualified. And that's a very tough feeling to have because like I've kind of like then it, one of the best jobs in the world. And I, I wasn't sure if I lived up to it. With that, I, like, it's just like stuck in my chest every single day. I would just consume articles, consume podcasts, consume all of the like growth hack, whatever medium articles out there every single day. I try to pass myself off to him, which I eventually realized wasn't the right way to do it. But like I pass myself off to him as like, I know what I'm doing. Right? But like, let's try this. If it doesn't work, let's try all of that. That made me learn very fast. But something that I've gotten, I think, a lot better at right now when it comes to those learnings is being very transparent about what kind of help you need to learn in an industry. So, for example, I know, like, at the moment, I'm trying to get better at understanding, like, new media. Like, I'm, like I sound like a boomer saying this, but, like, I would understand, let's say, how Twitter works or how LinkedIn and all of that platforms work because I, I, I was using those platforms since I was 18, right? But when it comes to TikTok and, like, YouTube, those are the things that are quite new. And for someone like me, I don't even feel like I've got a full understanding of it. And so I would try to get better at that stuff, but I wouldn't try to pretend like I'm an expert and then try to like paddle crazily to like get to that level, like fake it till you make it. I don't think that's a very healthy way. What I would instead do is like figure out who, who in my friend circle is great with that stuff and just like DM them and say, I need help with this. I'm trying to get better at this. Can I learn from you? Like, can we get onto a call where you can tell me at, at the very least, like where I should be looking for learning resources and, and materials? And that's one of the things that I've been trying to do with like on deck fellows, connecting and, and learning from each other's strength. And I guess it ties back into like being vulnerable with what you want as well. And that just goes such a long way towards learning because when you hack things, like, yes, you might be able to learn very fast, but if, you, if you're set on the wrong direction, you actually learn a bunch of stuff that's not as useful that you have to later, almost like later they become like legacy stuff. And you're consuming a lot of like get rich quick kind of tutorials, which might work in a moment, but like ultimately it doesn't really help you learn anything real. If you're able to get an industry expert to point you in the right direction, 
And if you are able to quickly sort through the materials, to con consume all of the stuff that's going to help you to get to like the next checkpoint, that's a much more solid growth curve. And if you talk to enough people, you can basically achieve the same level of growth without having to hack the whole process. And I think that for me has been like a really great discovery. And so like the conversations that I would have with Justin or anyone in the team right now would be like, okay, let's do this. I'm actually not an expert on how to do it, but here's how I'm going to, I'm going to be learning. And I would appreciate if you guys can point me in like this direction, that direction. And that's sort of the conversation that we try to have for like everyone. Like our writer might be asking that conversation for how to monetize a Substack newsletter. Our designer might be asking that question to see how we can drive, let's say, impressions for, for, for like native clips on, on TikTok. And uh, our production guy might be asking how we can do that for like the best tech stack for recording the podcast. And everyone is like vulnerable and asking for help. But then we all know what each other is like working on. And so that becomes a much more symbiotic relationship, I think, among, among the whole team. And I think that's better than just like hacking things and making sure that people see me as someone who's capable, whereas everyone's like super stressed, like beneath the surface. Yeah, that's so true. It's a tough skill to learn, to be honest. I mean, I think I myself, I'm still learning that right now because, you know, you know, everybody tells you that you're an expert. <laughs> so on A or B or C, right? And because you achieve X or Y, right? You know, it's like so many people are like, you understand business because yeah, you went to have a business school. And I'm like, what are you talking about? You know, like, <laughs> you know, like, like that's, there's plenty of companies that have been totally screwed over by Harvard MBAs. Yes, you know, all the top big tech companies now are being run by MBAs now, but, you know, it's still a different thing, right? And so I think it's a tough, tough to be vulnerable while still working to share your expertise, you know, and, and be a leader because there's a tough Venn diagram to be part of, right? You know, be an expert, be a leader and be vulnerable. You know, to be in the middle is probably like the sweet spot where everybody loves you, <laughs> really, well, everybody really re respects you and understands how to work with you. And it's a moving target, right? You know, like, that spot is different this week and that spot is different next week. One of the things that I've found was I think leaders, more effective leaders that I've seen are folks who wouldn't really necessarily proclaim themselves as leaders. But if you ask anyone else in a team, like their presence is so huge and it's so felt across the team. I remember when I was building my first startup, I cared very much about being the CEO and being on, the, on, on like papers. You know, if, if there's any press being done about our startup, I want to be in that like on that, on that page, like in the picture, because I felt like that was validation for all of my hard work, which was deserved. And when we had a team, I would be very forceful in terms of exerting my leadership presence for the whole team. I would be like, let's set up like weekly sync calls. Here's how we're going to delegate. You're in charge of this. You're in charge of this. And like, you report to me, all that. And it was in retrospect, a lot of the things like carving up roles and responsibilities are the right things to do, right? Like you can't function without setting up those expectations. But you can communicate all of that stuff in a, in a much better way. And I think leadership is like 50% about communication. The other 50% is probably, I don't even know, maybe like, I think it's like 80% communication, to be honest. I think it's just about how you talk about stuff and how you, how you communicate to each person on the team. Throughout the whole journey, going through startups and I think working with Justin Khan as well, it's like I've learned to be, like still now, like I don't think, I don't consider myself to be a leader. I consider my role to be like, you know, the guy that, that, that like unclosed toilets, that's how I consider myself to be. Like whenever someone, like if someone is put in charge of like design or production and like one day they like, they can't do their work. Like they would have to, there's like stuff that's stuck in the toilet, right? And so what my job is, is I would just come in and just make sure that that whole channel is like done. Like it's unstuck. I, I got to clean all of that stuff away. So the whole thing is like flowing. And then wh whoever is doing that job can just like manage the whole thing themselves. That's literally what I think of myself. Like, and it's a funny skill set that you have to learn. It's like problem solving. It's not like leadership per se. But yeah, I think that's what I try to get a lot better at. And also a lot better at communicating what needs to be done and what we all want to get to as a team. Those kind of skill sets, I think, help me actually build much stronger teams without having to be at the forefront. Like if I disappear for like a month, hopefully like a year, <laughs> I feel like... For my third startup, or even for this current project, like we've got such a great team that if that happens, nothing will change. And I think if, if that's the sort of feeling that you get as a leader, it's very gratifying. When you rule as a, as a leader, like a very forceful leader, ultimately it sucks your life away. And you, you can never detach yourself from the company. And it's very scary. Whereas if you're sort of like more into like trans, transformational leadership, or you're building people to be like the future leaders of whatever they're, they're good at, like eventually it's almost like you're hitting early retirement. And... I just feel like it's a much better way to 
make sure things get done and people are actually excited about what they're doing. Well, you know, I love what you say. I just got to push back on you here a little bit. I mean, you are a plumber way of solving problems. I think you're setting yourself short a little bit here, right? Based on what we just discussed and what I know about you. There's at least like, you know, two more, there's at least two more identities I see you as well as say out there, right? I mean, I think the first identity I see in you is that you're definitely an explorer, right? <laughs> because you're doing moonshots, you're going to new geographies, you're going to new verticals at minimum on top of being a plumber. Uh, you're also an explorer, right? And you're just finding out new things, you know, learning and when things are uncertain. That's this one. And the second thing I see in you, I think is really interesting is I think you're a very strong editor, you know, view, right? I don't know what you want to call it, you know, editorial. And I think obviously most people think of editors as not big, nasty, evil people who remove the voice of the artist, et cetera. But you know, I think editors, they're the best editors are well beloved by, you know, authors and publishers because it's a thought partner, right? You know, it's a, it's a partnership, right? It's, a, it's about figuring out the essence of the writing, the essence of that. And I can definitely hear that editorial tone where you're able to like summarize in many ways your own experience, but also the experience of the people you've met along the way. You've, I think you boiled down your first co-founder pretty well, actually. And then you boiled down your second co-founder actually pretty well as well. And, and also Justin as well. I think you actually captured the essence of Justin much more because if you ask me to describe Justin, I'll be like, I'll give you a bunch of anecdotes, but I wouldn't be giving you the essence of who he is as a, as a person, right? And I think you did a much better job in five minutes, five minutes than you know, I would over you know, a one-hour dinner, right? I think you're more than a plumber. I think you're also an editor and uh, explorer. I appreciate it. So like I, I told myself after I felt my first startup, I was like, communication is going to be one of my growth tra trajectories for like the next five or 10 years. Like I want to be, I watched one of the videos where Michael Seibel was speaking for YC. That was actually my first time getting to learning some of this YC stuff. And he was such a great communicator. I was like, I just want to speak like him. Like, honestly, like he, he, when he says things, it's so succinct and it's so effective and he just doesn't waste any words on, on things. And later I actually found out like, you know, he was great, but like all of the experienced startup founders are great in terms of communicating their business idea, you know, their thesis, how, you know, how the team is functioning, what kind of help they need. And I think it's like, a, it's like a product of intentionally trying to work on this craft. And so I knew that I had to get there eventually one day or the other. And, you know, better to start early than late. So, yeah, I think communication and what being better at editing some of this stuff and being able to communicate things in a much more succinct way that gets some of those ideas across, especially what about people, that's like 100% of where, like me, myself, like I try to grow in. And I think getting back to your earlier point, I still think like primarily like the work that's been done for the podcast, for everything else has been cranked out by people on my team. And I think we've got really great editors. We've got really great designers on the team. What I think I might add, qualify a bit to my early statement is the majority of my job is like plumbing, right? Like I'm, I'm blocking them. But when there are new initiatives that needs to be taken, typically what happens is everyone is you know, so caught up in, in, in doing their work that you have to be the person who's like, let's say two steps ahead. So for me, when everyone is like, if we moved on to, let's say YouTube, we would like spend a, a couple of weeks. I mean, actually not that much, not, not that much time. We would spend a couple of days to get our, our cover art stuff right. And then we'd have like the thumbnail set up before we even launch. Like I'm already looking for the next thing. I'm thinking, okay, once this is done, like what's going to be next. And so I would be looking into, let's say TikTok or some kind of growth hacks with, let's say integrating with some kind of newsletter or doing media partnerships. And, and when everyone is like trying to make that thing, that one thing go well, I would start testing out this other channel. And then once, you know, it's like, it's quite scary when you put yourself in a position because when I go into like this new channel, this new experiment, I have no support, right? I have to figure out what needs to happen. I have to figure out who we should talk to, what, what kind of emails should be sent, like all of that. I think there's, like, there's some certain kind of skills that you need to master in order to, first of all, spot what those opportunities are. And then second, follow through on some of the earlier things that you can do to like build like a basic framework of how things might work. And then once things started to work, once you have more people who you can dedicate, then it's like, okay, how do we, how do I onboard someone? So they're able to do all of this stuff 10 times better than I can. And basically not run, running into any troubles every day. And so like, I feel like one of my jobs is like, yes, I'm a plumber, but like I'm almost hopping between different pipelines, if that makes sense. And it's like figuring out what the new pipeline is hopping over, and then try to explore for a bit, get it working, put someone on it, and then like go somewhere else. But like if I stay in one place for too long, I, I feel like 
like I would love to for some of the stuff I actually like doing like community building. I love it. But if I stay in one place too long, that's doing a disservice to the whole team because my, my role is to like not be stuck in one place for too long. And if I, if I do that, we lose that on like opportunities and experiments that we can run. So I think that's one of my learnings, I guess, as someone uh, who's, who's building teams and using that plumber analogy, it's like you, you yourself can't get stuck in that place as well. You just got to keep moving around. Yeah. I mean, I think the plumber is the base when I'm saying, you know, you got an explorer and that huge editor point of view. Double click on something here, right? So you mentioned this earlier. How old are you? 23. Okay. And when was your first startup, the one that, that failed? When you, when you first founded it, how old were you? Like 18. 18. So it's been effectively been, what, five years? Five years, yep. Five years. If you manage to get from there, from 18 to 23, can you imagine where you're going to be between 23 to 28? I know it's, I know it's hard to think, but I'm just, I'm just, for the point of the, for the listeners, I'm just pointing out, like these are, you know, I think you're speaking with the sophistication and maturity of someone in their late twenties, even their early thirties <laughs> about how they see their role, about what things are there. I think there's a lot of exciting trajectory they're going to have. I don't know if you see it yourself, but as someone who is like over the hill, you know, headed towards the pastures, you know, as a 33 year old person, I, I see it. By comparison, I can tell you by at the age of 23, I had crashed out of high school pretty much because, you know, I, my, my girlfriend passed away and so I was grieving. I, I was in the military for two years. I joined undergrad when I was 21. I graduated from university when I was 23. So I was just entering, I guess, my second job, I guess, if you count the military as the first job. And yeah, you know, I don't think I, you could have asked me to articulate a leadership philosophy. I mean, this is not a race or a competition to see who's wiser, or more mature at what age, but I think it's, I just want to point out that. I'm sure there's like tons of stuff that I need to learn still. Like I have no idea how leaders were able to, if you think about some of those other companies, like when, you, when you're running, you know, 150, 160 people across the board, or if you have to balance up like considerations from, let's say we had this interview with Emmett Chair the other week that we launched, being able to manage a company like Twitch and manage not just like your employees, but like expectations from the communities and stuff and, and your investors. That's a job that I think would be like super hard, right? Same thing with like politicians, managing your electorate, managing people who are voting for you, who had expectations for you. I think those are much like, there are much greater leadership lessons out there. And like, for me, I'm like, I'm basically working with a group of friends that I, that I like, and we just like make some you know clips here and there. There's not too much of a, I think leadership philosophy that's involved. So like, I think five, 10 years later down, like I, I wouldn't be at a level where I'm like complete, like ever. It's just more about how do I get to those places where I'm able to see and possibly learn from doing some of those more leadership oriented stuff. Like, yeah, like if you think about companies like Coca-Cola and having offices around the world and being able to coordinate those kind of activities from an HQ, that's some amazing skills, skills involved. And yeah, I don't even think that's like something that you can learn from an MBA. It just, it, it has to come from like failures and like repeated practice. Mm, yeah. I mean, as a friend, I would say, I think you put Coca-Cola on a pedestal, right? I mean, Coca-Cola was, I think the biggest thing, I, I, my favorite class when I was at Harvard MBA was I took a class in entrepreneurial history. So I love history and, you know, I watch like extra credits and all these history, you know, stuff. I read Wikipedia, you know, at night. And I think I took this class entrepreneurial history. And I think the part that was really interesting to me was just like how every company was founded, right? You know, like, and Coca-Cola is a big conglomerate now and so, so forth, but it was founded by a founder and there were early employees that made it who it is today. You know, Mitsubishi, you know, the logo, it's, it's, he was a disgraced samurai uh, who had, whose house was, you know, on the rocks and he had to figure out a new route in a, in a new Japan, modernizing Japan, and he made it into Mitsubishi, you know? You know? Chanel was a person, a, you know, a personality and someone who partied and she converted her name into a, you know, a brand and a company. I don't know, I feel like the movie, you know, I think we fast forward to the ending too quick a little bit. I think, I think and it kind of goes back to what the first thing you ever said, right? Which is the problems of the companies that have tough times are a reflection of the founder and the founding team. And I'm pretty sure, I mean, as, as you know, like when this continues growing bigger and bigger, I think it's going to succeed. And I'll tell people like, how do you manage it? And you're just going to be like, oh, 
I just built it around the way I like to work, right? You know, you know, just you know, it's not just a shadow, but the upside is also going to be. Yeah, well, that's the dream. I think in the next five years, you're going to build this out into something that's amazing, and it's going to be it's going to be built around the way that you like to build it. That's all. And everyone's going to be like, well, "It's really difficult to lead this way," and you're like, "No, this is the way I like to lead." <laughs> <laughs> Let's hope that happens. I'm I'm trying to work hard every day to be deserving of of that dream. I think. Yeah. I think, well, you know, coming on time here, you know, just coming on the last question here is just like, there's a ton of like struggling founders out there, right? You know, I just recently met one and she was kind of having some tough times. I feel like every day I meet another, you know, another struggling founder reaches out to me and obviously it's one part tactical, which is how do I solve X? And then one part of psychology, right? <laughs> which is like, how do I do this, right? You know, it's like, this is not how to do this and how do I do this, right? So, you know, when you were your first startup struggling, you're thinking about, you know, closing down, you know, you're like, you know, it's on the cards. And if you could travel back at a time machine, you know, back to that person, you know, I was kind of curious, like, I guess, what would you say? Where would you take the person? What would you show? Yeah, well, <laughs> geez, that's a good question. In terms of things that I could do differently, I wish, I wish I'd close it down earlier. I think I was way too attached to that founder's mentality or have to see something through. Like I, I thought if I quit halfway, it means I wasn't dedicated enough as a founder and I wouldn't be able to achieve anything long-term in my life. That was wrong. And I shouldn't do that. Like when the product wasn't working and we, were, we, we knew our conversation with customers was getting increasingly difficult, that's a really good sign that things were, won't be working out. So I think I should have trusted my guts feeling earlier to like pull the cards out quicker and then moved on, move on to like another thing quicker as well. But I think in terms of like personal, personal advice that I would give to myself back then, it would be like you don't have to reply to every email like within five to 10 minutes after getting that because people can't see that you've seen it. Well, hopefully like now they can with like superhuman and stuff. But like back then, I don't think they can. I was worried. I was worried because I feel like this is something that people talk about a lot. But like everything that fails on behalf of a startup is almost like a personal failure. It's almost like you, you failed a test or something. Like if I, if there's a conversation with this guy and like the email, I sent a bunch of emails and this guy didn't reply, I felt like I failed at something, right? I felt like there's something that I'm not good at. And it's a reflection of, you know, me. Like, it, you know, it's like an indictment of, of my character almost. And I think that was like the motivator behind a lot of the things that I've done, which put me in a place where I was like catching my breath. You know, I, I would have anxiety. And like panic attacks. I think that was like the driving force behind all of it. It was this inability to separate myself away from the startup and having to consume my life in that fashion. So I would say, I don't know how you can do that. Probably like what I found useful for me was like meditation and forcefully pu pulling myself away from work multiple times during the day. But like I would, I would reply to a bunch of emails, but like just before my head starts spinning, I would just go take a shower or take a walk. And I'll like try to get in a bit of physical exercise, like sweat time every day. Those things like they would help ground you back into reality, and it helps you to see like your 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 day is going well, irrespective of whatever you need to deal with on the on the business side. So I would first of all say that. Second, I think it's really important that you know you have a bunch of friends who you're able to chat to or to talk about. You know, they could be your parents if, if you're lucky. <laughs> Having that support network where you had a terrible week and then you can go to someone's house, crash, get some food, chill out, come back and take on another week that's very useful and i didn't have that back in second year and i actually did the reverse i because of startup i like walked myself off from all of my friends because i thought whenever i meet them they'll be asking how's the startup going and i don't want to ask that question i don't even want to meet them you know i, I would think like i just got to hustle more and so i was like, very isolated and i think when you're isolated you become a lot more fragile and brittle if something shakes your foundation you're, you're just broken right i think it's important to have a few of those friends at the very least preferably founders, who's able to support you through that process. That's very important. And I think third, I was way too caught up in executing things. If I need to get something done, I just get it done without thinking about why. What I could have done is like learning a lot more. I could have watched a lot of YC videos a lot, e a lot earlier, got to know like what growth actually is. I could have gotten around to like no code platforms, but I never really had the time to learn things because I felt this urgency to just like get things done. If I need to send out 10 emails tomorrow, I'm like, okay, I need to wake up at like eight. I got a budget at this time. I got, like, I wasn't even thinking about what's the best way to like 
mass send emails. Maybe there's a tool that helps me do that. So I think founders sometimes get caught up in this like really terrible like execution loop where they're always optimizing time to, to get things done. And it's like, you know, my, my second co-founder actually uh, taught me a lot of that, about this. She would, she would be like, why are we doing this, right? And if it's only like when we have a compelling reason, then we can be like, okay, let's figure out how, to, how we can get this done as soon as we can. But like otherwise, like you don't have to do a lot of stuff that you do. I think when startups are working really well, and that's something that you typically find out later on with like some of the most successful founders, like they just do one, one or two things and that's it. They don't concern themselves with like getting everywhere. Like marketing, like no, no marketing. Like all, everything is like talking to customers. Like before you even get to product, like you know, you don't even have to build anything. You don't even have to code. Just like, you know, talk to customers, like spend your time on the phone. That's it. And like once you hit product market fit, it's like code and like growth hack. Like, like try to find channels in which you can have the sustainable engine of growth and it's dropping everything else. Don't talk to VCs. <laughs> don't, don't do marketing. Don't worry about competition. Don't go out for like, you know, founder catch-ups. So just do, like, do, do that. Like, I, think, I think once you get to that place where you're able to like crystallize all of your things into like one bucket, things become a lot easier and it gets a rid of a lot of the mental baggage that founders typically have. That's what, what I think worked really well for me. When things are going well, I'm like doing much less, but um, I feel a lot happier and I feel like I was seeing a direction for it. Yeah. And obviously you're talking a lot about the what of what you tell your 18 year old self, right? You know, like what to do, what to respond, you know, so so forth. I was just kind of curious, how would you have talked to your younger self? Would it, what would be a talk? I mean, you know, you know yourself as a recipient and you know yourself now of how you, you know, give feedback, right? Would you be more direct? Would you be more kind? Would you be more Socratic? Would you do it over some beer? Would you, you know, like, like, would you just bring some... I don't drink beer. I'll probably do it over some tea, I think. Over some tea. Like, it's like, like how would you have delivered that feedback and in a way you think would have been received well? I would be very gentle. I, I, I think that's a, that's a mistake people typically make with uh, you know, talking to some of the Gen Z folks. Like, all of the Gen Z founders I've, I've met are extremely amazing. Like, they're fascinating. And, like, I cannot wait until five, ten years later what kind of stuff they can actually build. What people tend to not realize is like for, for the current generation of Gen Z, they grew up with a lot of chips on their shoulders. Even with, with social media, you're, you're, you know, if I'm a girl, I'm like, I have to compete with someone like Charlie, where, where I don't even know where she's from, but sh her pictures, her TikTok videos are co constantly showing up on my screen. Like there's a lot of competition. There's a lot of uh, fragility that's like built into the fabrics of our Gen Z society. And, and because of that, you know, I think, one of the natural results, you can see like mental health going up, uh, like problems going up a lot. And family the, the dynamics tend to be like a big issue when it comes to like forming a family with like a, a Gen Z kid. So when it comes to giving feedback, I think you got to take into some of those stuff into account. Like, like the typical boomer way of like, like saying, okay, like this is just what it is. Like take it or leave it. Because like it's direct feedback and it's just how we, we do things around here. And, you know, don't take it personal. That stuff doesn't work. Like it's good intention, but it's executed poorly. Like direct feedback is still very important. Like I, I give out direct feedback to every single person who's in a team. When things don't work out, I talk to them. But there has to be some art in how you're delivering that, especially if we're to like someone who's young, like 18, let's say right now. But what I would do is I would frame it in a way where I would explain the motivations of where that's coming from. I would, I would talk about things. Like I would talk about how I felt. Like for example, if, if let's say if, if you're like a designer on a team and you're like 18, or if you're a founder where you, you know, your company is failing or whatever, I'm an investor, I, I, would, I would say, like when you did this, I noticed myself feeling this way instead of saying, I'm, I'm this because you, you, you've done that. Like I think being able to like pull yourself away from those observations, just like give a very clear on the description of, of what's happening to you, through you, right? And telling that to someone who's young and like literally giving them like a ton of options to improve, to change, or even give them like places to go to get help or whatever, you know, all of that. Like I would, if, if I'm having someone who's like failing at a, a, a designer job, I'll be like, I can refer you to go to On Deck to take like a designer fellowship. Like, let me know if you want to, like I can try to find your sponsors or whatever. Like that's something that would get those people hyped. Like they would want to, to grow because that's the first thing that got, that got them into like startups and whatever in, in the first place. So like, yeah, I think it's like removing yourself away from the equation, communicating stuff in a more, much more gentle way. And also just outline, like relentlessly, relentlessly outline personal growth, like next steps, like whatever you can do to help that person succeed. 
that that I think reciprocates when it comes across in a very authentic way when you communicate to Gen Z, a Gen Z audience. Wow, that's amazing! And wow, I never thought about that way. I think you're right. You know, social media is as it makes everyone fragile because there's so much competition, right? You know, it's in especially 18. I think that I think that's something I do have to reflect on as well. Yeah, that's actually one of the one of the common criticisms about Gen Z people, Gen Z folks, is like they're very like like tr- like easy to be triggered. I mean, I want to say what I I wouldn't want to say it's kind of true, but like, yeah, like they are easy to be triggered. But like, you got you have to understand why. Like, why why are we so fragile? Like, maybe for me, like I'm easy to be triggered as well. Why why is that the case? Because we've been consuming it's information overload from day one, right? Like we we grew up with with, with, you know, with cell phones and we're constantly competing with people. Like I got my LinkedIn set up when I was 14, and I've been like keep updating it ever since. Imagine being able to like compete on likes and whatever you need to get on those kind of platforms since you were 14. Like, you know, that's just like a lot of pressure that, that built for you. And I, I used to have like anxiety issues as well. And I think I can relate to a lot of the things that, that's currently, that people are currently processing through and tough feedback given in that, that, that really like top down fashion, expecting someone to not take it personal. is just not the way to go forward with like this Gen Z audience, hundred percent. That was really helpful. Well, I think that's pretty much on time. I just want to say for those who want to carry on a conversation, you know, you can go to jeremyow.com. There's a club to discuss this episode. But I want to recap, I think to me, I think the three most important parts, you know, I think from this conversation, right? I think, I think for me that really resonated for me, number one was not about the failures or the success even, right? But I think it was, yeah, like your rate of personal learning and what you took away from each time and being very intentional about it was really what stuck out, stood out for me. That's one. And the same thing that stood out for me was you doing moonshots, you know, and meeting demigods, you know. Uh, <laughs> and I think that's it's a fun story, but it's also a, a nice way to think about it because I think at best people are like trying to keep flat or pace or improve five percent every week. I think I like what you said about moonshots as a different, very different approach. And I think the third thing I, I like what you said was I think you often talk about not just what you would do, but also how you would do it, right? And so about fixing problems but your approach is either as a plumber and of course my contention as well as explorer and editor um, but you know you talked about your feedback about what how you would you know help yourself as a first-time founder as a young one versus you know how you'd approach it right and i think that's something that so many people think about is like they're not thinking about how to give feedback they're thinking about what feedback to give but the how is is way more important than the what right you know you know and i always tell people it's like no one cares what words came out of your mouth during the feedback, you know, it's either positive or it's negative, right? But it's like how you deliver it is like 99% of what you're going to remember. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. It was a pleasure to have you. I appreciate it, Jeremy. I really appreciate it.